Moving on to our second session, the session will revolve around skill development for a gig economy. The panelists are Sandeep Ahuja, Vice Chairman, BNW SSC and Director of VLCC Personal Care, Prasad Rautre, Head, Corporate and Alliances, Airtel Payments Bank, Manas Singh, Chief Business Officer, Apna, Mithun Shivatsa, Chief Executive Officer and Founder, Blohan. The session will be moderated by Gayatri Vasudevan, who is the Chairperson of LabourNet Services India. Gayatri has deep experience of working in the civic and social organization industry. She has a Doctor of Philosophy focused on development economics and international development. May I now request Gayatri to introduce the panelists and begin the session. Over to you, Gayatri. Thank you, Ishita. Um, so I have uh, quite a stellar uh, panel and I have two, uh, um, uh, two of them actually who, who have, uh, um, let's say, are the face of the new age. Um, so uh, let me, uh, instead of uh, introducing them, I will allow them to introduce themselves. So uh, as they speak, as they come on to the panel, I'll allow each one to introduce themselves and start with a question. So let me first start with Prasad, uh, uh, who represents uh, Airtel Payments Bank. And um, as he was just saying, uh, that they have just turned profitable. So a big clap and a round of applause for them uh, as we move forward. So Prasad, let me give you a minute to introduce yourself and then come to you with a question. Okay, thank you, Gayatri, ma'am. Uh, 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 first of all, as an introduction, so I've been with Airtel uh, for almost two decades now. Uh, uh, I just, uh, last two years back, I joined this new startup of Airtel Payments Bank uh, right now. Uh, part of the executive committee and building this particular bank. And I was telling Gayatri ma'am that we turned profitable yesterday thanks to our customer base. Uh, I do the alliance and corporate SMB and the government ecosystem uh, for the bank. Uh, uh, delighted to be a part of this. Um, looking forward to this, uh, this session. Uh, I have been closely associated with Nudge, uh, not associated, following. Uh, because a couple of our ex-colleagues work in that particular organization and that is a special bonding that we have with NSTC and I'll, I'll, I'll refer both of them what we can do together more during our discussions, you know. So that's my small introduction. Yeah, so Prasad, let me get a question through you and then I'll move to others' introduction and question. So, um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of discussion about financial institutions and the gig model. Uh, so I first want to understand... Do you really see gig model as the way forward for financial institutions? And where do you see these things going? Okay. Uh, uh, had you asked me uh, before this question before the pandemic happened to us, I could have said, no, it couldn't happen. But I think it has forced us to now build in new systems and processes, which actually makes the gig economy a very powerful tool or, or people ecosystem, which can help. And I'll give you some examples of why I'm saying this. Uh, and some statistics to give you some facts, you know. Uh, I'll straight away go, I'm, I, it's not towards the rural India or let's say the Bharat, but I'm generally trying to tell because financial inclusion, I personally believe is absolutely, um, maybe a very aggressive statement, not there in the so-called Bharat. A bit of in Hindustan, but maybe around something around, uh, you know, in, in uh, this thing. So, uh, if you look at... Um, uh, what we are doing in Bharat, we could, we are actually doing a lot of uh, workforce scaling because uh, for people who have got feature phones, just to give you perspective, there are 32 crore feature phone users who are not bank yet banking in our system. Just as I'm giving an example, there are also smartphone users who are not banked. To actually get them into the banking ecosystem itself, we need scaling. And it cannot happen by just walking into banks because there are no branches. So you have to reach out to them. That's number one. So the people who reach out to them need to be certified uh, proper financial advisors or, or for that bad so-called correspondents or bank sathis, if you have to really put it, that's what we call them. Uh, we do a lot of scaling around that and therefore we have seen because of the advent of the technology called internet, which has really gone in the last two years right into the hands and that's why today we can do such kind of events uh, over a call. Uh, with the stability of video possibly coming in, uh, video-based uh, trainings, Plus, I would say feature phone based voice trainings have been two, uh, you know, particular, you know, categories of technology that we have used. Got a certified course created through the authorities to ensure that they actually become 
uh, ready enough to really be advisors to financial inclusion. So I would say it's a big yes. Uh, it is a very promising one and has helped a lot for the bank to really grow. And today, the good news is, ma'am, uh, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we got through this gig, you know, manpower, 65% of our business correspondents are women. And that's a very, very big insight to us that rural India is run, brought up, born, done everything by women. Nothing against, uh, you know, bias towards any, but that's a fact, right? So women, uh, skilling ability, uh, as well as uh, technology used to create uh, such kind of, uh, you know, sachet products, feature phone-based friendly you know, modules, and you can actually create a very powerful, you know, ecosystem which can actually take care of the requirements of the regulatory yet make the things happen. So that's my uh, view about, uh, so it's a big yes. Thanks so much, Prasad. Now let me go to Manas. Manas, I'll just ask you to introduce yourself in a minute and then I'll come to your question. Great. Hi, Gayatri. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me here. Super, super excited. Um, I am the chief business officer at a young uh, young company called Apna. We are, uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are working to create um, opportunities for um, for people in the blue and gray color segment, which is essentially, uh, you know, what we call India's rising working class, and which also happens to contribute to upwards of ninety percent of, of all the labor workforce. Um, so it is it is truly really the bulk of um, and the backbone of what's driving India. Um, we are uh, what we do is we are um, we are India's largest professional networking and jobs platform when it comes to this segment of um, uh, of the workforce. Um, and, and we, we try and do that through three core pillars. Um, the first one being uh, discovering and enabling matching of jobs um, across India in a hyper-local uh, way. Second, uh, by creating a community of sorts. So just like you know, folks like uh, uh, you and me here on the call have LinkedIn that we extensively use. Um, and then we are creating a LinkedIn of sorts for, um, for, the Indians, for India's rising working class which enables peer-to-peer -peer interactions, learnings, um, you know, enhancement of the network of, uh, of, say, a carpenter or a plumber, who today generally finds opportunities by you know, speaking to someone who knows someone else. And is, is typically uh, rest restricted to, um, uh, you know, to the physical world because he or she hasn't been given access to creating a digital pro professional identity or having tools like LinkedIn. And finally, the third one is up scaling right uh i think tremendous tremendous opportunities to solve for employment gap by creating um uh, you know upskilling opportunities at scale <clears throat> again through using technology to be able to allow each of these users in the workforce to elevate their opportunities by going to the next level right? and so that's what apna has been doing um we've been around 18 months <clears throat> excuse me um, into our, our creation, but we already a market leader in this segment when it comes to opportunity creation. Um, prior to joining Apna, I was uh, I was a partner at uh, at a global consulting firm, Boston Consulting Group. Had been with them for almost seven years. Uh, worked across uh, around the world, um, serving and living in the U.S. and London and China. Um, but you know, I think the the draw to come back to India and and add to our our growing economy and and. Uh, and the requirement in the social realm was just too much. So here I am. Thanks so much, Shivanis. I think all of us are sort of uh, eagerly looking at the journey that Apna will do to transform the economy. So I'll come back to you the second round with a set of questions. Uh, so let me just move to uh, Sandeep. Uh, uh, you were amongst the first industry to actually adopt gig economy. So would you... Uh, Introduce yourself, Sandeep, as well as address the where do you see the beauty industry go from both the gig economy as well as skilling? Sandeep, maybe you're on mute. It's a bit feeble. Yeah. 
You're on mute. Yeah, let me try and click this. So I think while Sandeep is fixing the technology, maybe Manas, I'll come to you. Um, you know, uh, the backbone of your work is on digitization. So I want to really understand, uh, um, and I'm sure the viewers would also really want to understand what does technology uh, mean in this in this sense, right? There is security, there is verification, there is digitization, both in terms of uh, individual information as well as for upskilling. If you could just throw some light on that, I think that would be very useful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's um, yeah, there used to be a time when uh, people would use the phrase, the, the basic requirement is roti kapra makan. I think now it's become roti kapra makan and internet. Um, that's the reality of the world that, that we've come to, right? Um, I think it's it's just open up uh, this whole era of possibilities and opportunities right as the internet penetration in india is systematically increased uh, you know i think it's also no it's not a hidden fact that <clears throat> today we are almost around 600 million internet users and you know it's slated to be close to 900 million by 2025 right? um, and, and you know as prasad mentioned uh, it's I think banking has certainly been uh, a huge benefactor of, uh, of digitization, but now we've started to see this um, come in the space of opportunity creation for, uh, for, for blue and gray collar workers as well as the gig economy, right? Um, and pandemic has just accelerated that whole process of digitization like we've, like we've never seen before, right? Uh, now technology, when you think about technology, right, I think it's, it's doing some some really amazing things for uh, for for folks in the in the broader segment of the labor force. Right, uh, this segment has largely been unorganized. Uh, I think if you think of the non-farm uh, farm segment of uh, of the labor force, I think close to about 20, 25 percent um, of that segment's uh, opportunities are are formalized. I think technology, in the first uh, in the first and foremost important way, is is driving uh, extremely fast organization and formalization of these unorganized sector. I think it solves for speed, it solves for scale, and it solves for this across different sectors. Now, India, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's such a diverse country uh, and it gets reflected in job scenarios. The use cases that you see um, in the Delhi and Mumbai, right, um, are very different from what you would see um, say in, in the manufacturing hubs of uh, Jamshedpur or Bhubaneswar. Uh, what technology is doing in Delhi or Mumbai, it's allowing for talent and candidates to find hyper-local job opportunities. So when a Swiggy um, is looking for, say, gig workers um, in terms of delivery partners, um, they're often trying to look for folks who are within you know, a certain area of, uh, of a certain um, a restaurant or a pool of restaurants. And similarly for a for a gig worker, right? He or she often doesn't want to travel too far off from their home because it adds time and hence adds money uh, to uh, to their opportunity. And so, what the technology been able to do is precisely match uh, a gig worker or a delivery partner in this case um, to opportunities that are say within five to six to ten kilometers of where they're basing, right? Uh, again, dramatically increasing their uh, their ability to now be part of the workforce without uh, without really taking adding too much pressure um, on their time and resources. So, um, when you talk about the you know the non Delhi non Mumbai sort of uh, setups um, like a Jamshedpur or Nasik, you're talking about manufacturing hubs. Right? The use case there changes dramatically because often what you're looking at is migratory use cases of uh, of workers from from nearby cities to be able to go and travel to these um, these manufacturing hubs. And Bhadi is another example, right? Um, again, having discovery of jobs um, uh, to, uh, to people who may not be in those manufacturing hubs today by view of technology, by view of um, uh, by, by enabling, um, you know, at click of a button by opening an app, uh, is, is just made so such a dramatic change to, to the lives of these workers. Um, and this, this aggregation has only been possible through technology, right? I mean, if you think about it, there was a time when, I mean, even today, a lot of the cities, opportunities are, um, 
are presented via classifieds in local newspapers, right? And that, that model is not scalable. There are only so many opportunities that you can actually place in a classified newspaper. Um, but, but technology doesn't restrict you to do that. Um, I think the other piece that you did speak about, um, Gayatri, is, you know, um, it's, it's also made the whole process very democratic in nature, right? If you think about it, uh, you know, it's, there is no more a difference uh, when it comes to uh, discovering of, of opportunities between someone who is, uh, who's a white collar worker or someone who's, uh, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of opportunities. Um, the same amount of information, uh, you know, the access to the details of a job, um, access to getting interviews on the spot uh, through technology, um, online interviews, onboarding of the whole process through technology has made everything so democratic, right? There is, today, it doesn't matter if you don't have access to, you know, getting into um, a car and traveling uh, two hours and paying for that Uber to get you an interview. You can actually do all of that and click of a button. Uh, it's just level the playing field, and technology is unable to do that, right? I think the final piece around um, so much of um, of the verification and, and ensuring that uh, um, you are we are matching opportunities with the right set of people um, uh, is has been enabled by technology through digital identification and verification of documents, right? Uh, these are things and use cases that 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 make it um, so much easier for, for us to actually be certain that we are only presenting opportunities uh, that are verified, that are trustworthy and credible, because it has been a challenge uh, in the country, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with a lot of unfortunate um, uh, scams and frauds happening in the space where, where people take undue advantage of connecting uh, vulnerable workforce um, labor to, be, uh, to opportunities. So again, that's um, uh, just my two cents on that. Thank you, Manas. I think there are a lot of follow-up questions. But let me uh, go to Sandeep first and return to you. So uh, Sandeep, I uh, just wanted you to introduce yourself as well as, uh, you know, you represent one of the industries which went, uh, uh, so Prasad was talking of the fintech industry which went gig and looked at skilling and upskilling in that context. So if you could give us the same perspective uh, in which I think whenever we think of gig, beauty is the first which comes to mind. So please do introduce yourself as well as uh, give us a context of where do you see the next few years going? You may just want to log in from another machine or something. As something is wrong, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll just wait for you. Prasad, uh, let me come to you, Prasad, while we're waiting yeah. for. Or is it fixed, Sandeep? Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, all right. Okay, sorry, my, at the outset, my apologies for, for this glitch. Um, people have been talking about technology, but this kind of technology always gets to me. So there um, has to be a traffic jam somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So it's either yeah. still so, or internet. Please go ahead. So a quick one. Um, and as far as my own background is concerned, I have uh, been um, in the uh, beauty and wellness business now for about 20 years as um, uh, the former managing director and group CEO for VLCC. I continue to be associated with all of VLCC group companies uh, in various um, areas of responsibilities. As far as VLCC itself is concerned, um, uh, it's a beauty and wellness services and products player that's been in existence for about 30 years now. It currently operates uh, across 310 locations in 12 countries. Um, operates 
over 200 uh, wellness and beauty clinics uh, in 10 countries across Asia, uh, operates um, 94 VLCC institutes of beauty and nutrition, which are essentially um, uh, skill development institutes, which offer entry level and uh, skill enhancement courses in the uh, beauty and wellness domain. Uh, we also manufacture in our own manufacturing facilities, uh, two of them in India and one in Singapore, a large range of skin care, hair care, body care products that we use as treatments and therapies in our treatments and therapies, uh, as well as in our trainings, uh, as also retail them across 250,000 node outlets across the countries that we operate in. So that in nutshell is what we're all about. Um, uh, to respond to what Gayatri said regarding the, uh, the, the gig economy within the beauty and wellness space, uh, you know, the fact of the matter remains, as she rightly pointed out, the gig economy has always been in existence in this domain. Uh, and to my mind, uh, not only in this domain, I think India for the longest time was a gig economy. If you look at it, if you break it down to uh, at the ground level, which essentially means who are the gig players? Gig players are who don't have a regular nine to five full time employment. These are people who are what has always been in our case, daily wage workers. Uh, uh, the change has been uh, within the uh, beauty and wellness context, at least, that earlier people got into the gig economy associated with uh, the beauty and wellness space uh, out of lack of choice. Um, they needed to earn a living. Uh, they would join uh, uh, at the entry level as a apprentice, so to say, to uh, an existing uh, uh, practitioner of beauty services and then learn on the job and then look at getting uh, employment uh, either at a regular basis or as in, in on a gig basis. Um, so that was done out of out of the need to earn a living. However, with the with the with the advent of what I'd call or what's commonly called as the Generation Y or followed by the Generation Z, where you know if you were to look at them themselves in terms of their behavior patterns, these are people born you know in the 1980s onwards. These are people who uh, whose characteristics were more to do with, you know, uh, being more outgoing. Uh, they were slightly more realistic uh, in comparison to the earlier generation, which was, I think, slightly more materialistic. And then uh, you look at uh, the generation, uh, the current generation, which is, which, which I think is possibly far more grounded than any of us were and are uh, at time at that age. Um, and these are people who are making uh, effect, making choices because they have choices today. Uh, and we see that happening in our, uh, and I have seen that happening in the last 15 years since then, since I've been directly responsible for the, 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 the training institutes that we have. Uh, the current batch of students in the last seven or eight years are people who've consciously wanted to get into this industry because they were genuinely interested in it and were confident that even if they didn't get a job in a nine to five kind of environment, they would make a success of it themselves because they were interested in it. And that I think is a stark difference uh, in comparison to any other vertical within the several domains, uh, vertical of the gig economy within several uh, uh, work domains. Um, and that's, uh, that's, I think, um, a difference that uh, I have seen across the country in many, many uh, uh, regions. Uh, and it's not, it's not something that I, I'm, I'm also uh, happy to report to you. It's not something that is metrocentric. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, training institutes in tier two, tier three cities, and we see the same phenomena there where people are 
taking a conscious choice to sign up for these programs uh, without even a um, you know things like guaranteed or help in in placement is no longer a concern uh, when a student joins a VLCC institute. What is a concern to that VLCC institute student is his ability to earn uh, and the level of skill that he gets uh, uh, at the job. And I think that uh, that is a trend that has changed dramatically over the last five or seven years. I think that's an interesting perspective. Let me just come to you with a follow-up question. Um, as you said, uh, uh, income is not an issue. Uh, they come join because there is aspiration there. Uh, there is a there is a desire to be in the industry. Uh, what what would you say policymakers need to do uh, in terms of social security? I think this entire pandemic has thrown up the whole issue of gig and social security. Um, so what is it as a financial, uh, um, uh, let me not say only financial, but general social security with regard to the beauty sector, as well as let me look at it both, what would you ask a policymaker as well as a leader in the beauty sector, what would you say as an institution uh, is needed to do? Because placement in my mind is directly linked to that. Well, you know, one of the one of the things uh, about the beauty and wellness space is, is that uh, it's a good space to be in at this point in time, despite you know the the hiccup of the or the disruption on account of the pandemic, because this is an industry that has been going at a dramatic pace in the last three or four years, and it's slated to possibly have uh, the fastest recovery in any industry um, uh, once the whole pandemic sort of sword is off our heads. Um, so, getting employment within this sector is not necessarily a challenge, uh, and that's an important point to make for the simple reason that uh, uh, you know skill development is is all about having people acquire skills that they can use productively at a time when they need them. Um, now, the use of those skills productively is only if there is a demand for those services. And I see in a lot of sectors where we're doing skill development, uh, there is a huge mismatch between, you know, employability versus the number of people coming into the workforce for that vertical. Um, fortunately, that's not the case in the beauty and wellness services sector. So to that extent, security for them in terms of ability to earn uh, uh, is, is not a challenge. But yes, uh, uh, there are several things, to my mind, off the cuff, that the, uh, that the establishment can do beyond just ensuring that they get a good level of training. And that's the post-training kind of uh, uh, nurturing, if I were to use that for the word. And that is not to class. One of the thing. One of the things is, don't classify them as as you know self-employed or independent contractors or whatever it is. The fact is that these are individuals who are actually, uh, to a large extent, daily wage workers. Um, and uh, there needs to be minimum wages enforceable uh, to anybody who hires them, um, even if it means on a daily wage basis. That's currently not monitored enough, uh, uh, unlike, let's say, you know, the, the, the construction sector, uh, where uh, the, at least, you know, the people who get hired, there is, to my mind, a large amount of oversight that ensures that they do get their minimum wages. Uh, it may not necessarily be even across the country, but certainly, yes, um, uh, there is a la reasonable assurance that the minimum wage is paid. And that's, that's not the case in the beauty and wellness sector. Uh, there is exploitation to that extent that happens, and especially in tier two and tier three cities. Um, the other is uh, other is benefits like you know ESI benefits like uh, possibly unemployment insurance, uh, and those are things that ha that can happen uh, only if the government. Uh, recognizes beauty and wellness as an industry. Um, what needs to be 
what needs to be acknowledged is that like for example the construction sector the beauty and wellness services sector at least is possibly one of the largest employers of of, of workforce uh, in the country many people don't realize it and anecdotally speaking let me tell you that there was an interaction that we were having as an industry forum with uh, one of the uh, union ministers recently um, uh, uh, and uh, he was he was surprised to hear uh, the kind of employment that we have generated as a industry and that's the lack of awareness that needs to be uh, addressed uh, and once you once there is realization that that this is an industry and needs to be recognized as an industry then all the aspects that you alluded to in terms of what the governments can do and what industry can do um, uh, for the benefit of the constituents uh, falls into place automatically. Thank you. I think that was a very useful per perspective. And I think I'll segue to Prasad on the same question. You know, the financial sector has been uh, a sector which has been uh, uh, practically a sunrise sector, right? Uh, where there is a feeling it is a white collar job, it's more secure, uh, social security is guaranteed. Uh, but with the new financial, uh, uh, like the payment, Airtel payment uh, uh, gateways that you represent, has actually brought in a different perspective to who's going to be employed and what the type of employment. What does it mean for the worker? as well as for the sector. See, uh, where I'm coming from, Prasad, is what, what we've learned, at least from, from uh, Sandeep's, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, insights has been that uh, there is a difference. Um, the sector industry recognition is important for social security and minimum wage. Whereas here, uh, with Manas as well as you, I would be asking the question in the reverse direction. Because uh, you, gig economy is the way to go for you. So what does it mean for the worker? What does it mean for you as an institution? Um, so I'll ask this question to you, Prasad, and then hand it over to Manas. OK, I think, uh, first of all, it is organizations like uh, what Manas brings to the table, or let's say, ma'am, yours, uh, uh, which is actually making it very structured, uh, very organized. And therefore, I would say that it also gives the courage and the ability uh, for us to go for a gig economy ecosystem, which actually brings in people at the local levels and to Manas's point of hyper-local recruitment and therefore making it very stable. Because one of the things that is very important in the financial sector is you need to be certified to be actually a financial expert, not expert, at least do the basics. And that is an important factor. Hence, we need many organizations like what Manas brings or, or others bring in which actually helps the certification program become democratized. And one of the examples, and which is why I said uh, we are actually working very closely with NSTC. Uh, I personally signed a contract last to last year before the pandemic happened. And we also customized a particular packaged digital onboarding process, Aadhaar enabled payment systems, uh, video KYC services. These are these are these are courses which makes the person know how to onboard, how to withdraw, what, what is an OTP and so on and so forth, which typically, with all due respect, are, are not covered by the so-called traditional large banks, right? These are new age technologies and you need gig economy uh, people to really absorb such kind of module technologies and then become skilled to really do it. And thanks to NSDC, actually, they helped us a lot. We actually powered close to 150 locations. We got a schedule made with them. And in fact, I'm happy to say that we have been recruiting quite regularly, although we went very digital and uh, they also, NSDC also reacted by giving digital cataloging around it also by mass, you know, training people. And when we open back, uh, uh, you know, uh, as and when you we know, we suitable to open back centers, we'll again go back to that particular model, but create those Shashi products. Here. So, you know, uh, I mean, I would say that uh, this pandemic has helped us to create a uh, or, or completely restructure the approach to getting people to do what they can like to do and also uplift their entire, uh, what do you call, social status. Uh, I mean, there is, of course, a benefit in the financial uh, you know, side of it, but it's more important to do the social status. And Gayatri, as I last time told you that 
uh, in your last question, uh, we are surprised, uh, not surprised, we were expecting or not to the extent that the kind of women entrepreneurship that has come up and people are coming and doing it is a phenomenal job. And this is not just our financial sector. I can also uh, tell you that in our sector, we will need a lot of physical presence also, unlike of what digital a lot of people think. Uh, I would rather therefore call it to go to a digital model, starting with a high physical, less digital, then go to a mixed hybrid physical, digital, then, then get to a digital, right? And this will then scale it up in a manner that for the urban local workforce, which, it's, uh, which we use, uh, is going to be digital first, but for the rural, it's going to be pure physical. In the category Hindustan, it is going to be physical digital. So it's a three modeled out approach on the trainings and therefore the upliftment. So NetNet, I think uh, anyway, uh, this is one of the largest recruiters of the, the segment is the largest recruiters of you know, manpower, right? So it, it will be great to work with organizations like what uh, Manas and others bring in to really create those, get certified and get recruited. You know, I mean, for example, I'll tell you, Airtel Payment Bank is looking for to annualize 30,000 people to work in the local economy at the local places to just open bank accounts. You know. uh, I'll give you a scale. Uh, we are opening close to 10 lakh bank accounts a month uh, as a bank only in rural. The total industry opens close to 10 lakh across India. You know, So that's the scale in which Airtel Payment Bank is working. But you will not hear us here. In All of us may not have heard, You know, except I work for the company. That's where I know this. Uh, we don't, you will not hear us because we are in category 4, 5, 6. And if you go to RBI's category 4, 5, 6 definition, um, it is 5,000 people who stay in a place is called as a category 6 village. Uh, less than 50,000 is, uh, you know, the village where you can call it as category 5. And uh, below 75,000 is category 4. I can fairly tell you there are no banks for 25 kilometers. So therefore, to get the local people trained there and they run the bank is very important. I mean, I say they run the bank. They have to do only four basic things. And I'm just going to put it because uh, normally this is the language they understand, the local language. Unko paisa nikalna hai, unko paisa jama karna hai, unko jo government benefits milta hai, unko paisa unke haath mein jana chahiye. And more importantly, the local guy who's doing it is the most trusted worthy guy. He has to be the most trusted worthy because he's finally a banker. Uh, Local language wala jo model hai, wo bahut zaruri hota hai. and that's why, pardon, I'm, I'm talking in Hindi because that is the way we have to, we have to talk the language of the country called Bharat. And I'm dividing the country into Bharat, Hindustan. Hamari liye bahut zaruri hai ye. That skilling is what is missing. The first skilling is missing right now also. I would urge that if, if, if Manas like companies can make it happen, it will be a fantastic rewarding back to, to uh, you know, you know, our segment of recruitment that we need. And that, and we need those kind of plenty of manpower. So that's my, that's Gayatri, my, you know, view about your question. Thanks, Prasad. Manas, I would want to give you the question, but I saw Mithun on the screen. And I think uh, I'm unfortunately going to have a short time. Mithun, would you quickly introduce yourself? And, uh, uh, you know, Mithun is uh, representing the other industry, which has blown uh, employment as well as skilling in India. So as logistics, uh, as you represent that, Mithun, would you just come in? Sure. I hope you guys can hear me. Is this yes, Mithun. Great. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm Mithun. I'm the CEO of Lohan. I worked in logistics for the longest time. And then I came back to India to kind of build something for India. And the key issue that we saw was the last mile in logistics. So the, once the good comes to the city and from there, it, it has to reach to the doorstep, right? So there are a lot of constraints. So we wanted to focus on that specific problem and build a logistics company around that problem. Uh, so, uh, I run Lohan. Lohan operates in close to 70 cities now. Uh, we do within the city, intra city logistics. Uh, we do boat tracking. Uh, we do hyper local. We do local. We do first mile, last mile within the city. And we also have our own network of warehouses, which enables super fast delivery of goods. So, fundamentally, what we are trying to do is uh, a lot of businesses are going online. We want to be the distribution layer for them, which is like real time, very fast. That's what we are building. So that's us, guys. Yeah. Uh, guys, guys, we are on mute, I guess. Yeah. This is the permanent problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mithun, quick uh, follow-up question to you. The logistics yeah. sector has actually really brought the issue of gig uh, social security 
and uh, does it need skilling or not these are three questions which are constantly asked uh, from a career perspective skilling upskilling from a career perspective social security is there a requirement both your ask of policy as well as an industry leader what's your thoughts sure i think um, my personal belief is a lot of indian startups work despite government policy right so even if government policies are not existent companies come drive they find a way to solve problems for both sides of the marketplace right both the demand side and the supply side as far as logistics is concerned i think uh, the government's done quite a few interesting policies especially around insurance etc uh, for truckers and but it's very very federal right it depends from state to state uh, so i think we have a moral responsibility take care of our supply side and we need to do whatever we can as founders though we are like you know we could be servants of capitalism we, we also need to be servants of the supply side and ensure that people are taken care of uh, from at least from the basics right when it comes to healthcare when it comes to like some level of assured earnings and so on so i think that is important and we need to build that trust and faith uh, either to the way we pay out or through setting up like uh, slightly more periodic payments and so on which are semi assured right so we need to do something like that so uh, that is one piece uh, in terms of uh, what are we doing and where where this is headed and where this piece is headed is uh, we believe that uh, 13 to 14% of indian uh, economic spend is on logistics so it's a fairly large sector now if you if you can bring bring even 10 20% efficiencies in the sector you can definitely look at uh, making uh, a big dent and reusing the same resources be it in healthcare be it in education so on right uh, the key thing here is upskilling as you mentioned and i think without upskilling companies fail the rate at change at which the businesses are kind of coming and going so every large business once it hits a certain scale is getting unpacked to smaller businesses right like for example uh, when we came in we were a subset of the larger national logistics business right now just a supply side which is getting drivers onto the platform there some players like apna for example helping companies right get drivers and so on right so what we are seeing is an unpacking happening at every level so it's very important the people who come in Uh, to the platform get out with more skills because most gig workers do not want to be like for example delivery boys all their life life or so on they all want to move up the strata so i think upskilling is a key part of the game and uh, as manas sandeep all of them touched upon it i think technology is the key piece thanks mithun uh, manas uh, i will come to you uh, manas um uh, you saw both prasad as well as mithun have referred to um referred to your platform um and uh, specifically the the hope that is there is on two fronts right uh, that there would be constant upskilling um so in the context of and i'm borrowing uh, prasad's words of bharat hindustan and india how do we really how do you see it for each category how do you see upskilling uh, Uh, happening where there's a career and and not just an episodal job yeah no um thanks guys three see i think one thing we uh, i'm sure we all will agree that um while the gig economy and the um and the huge opportunity creation that's that's happening at scale um is certainly uh, driving a lot of upliftment from an economic perspective um uh, to this to this labor class in india um there is just the basic human desire to continue to rise um up in 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 the hierarchy of the types of jobs and financial status right so no delivery boy delivery partner today always wants to be a delivery partner right um they want to keep improving their skill sets and keep moving up the ladder um so they can provide better opportunities for themselves for their families right um and i think that's where the the importance of upskilling comes in uh i think um it, you know while there are uh, there are segments and categories like beauty and wellness um 
that Sandeep pointed out, where um, where purely the desire to um, to upskill themselves uh, is enough because there is enough um, uh, enough market uh, structure being created where people have the confidence that hey, opportunities will be there if not as jobs, uh, as micro entrepreneurs. Uh, that people are, people would be willing to sort of invest in themselves um, without you know so called of a guarantee. There are still many other categories where a lack of an outcome related skilling uh, is a huge deterrent for people. Right? I mean, uh, a lot of this, a lot of the folks in this segment, I think the the challenges that they suffer are uh, unlike uh, you know. Um, uh, unlike for folks like you and me, uh, there is there is by by and large a limitation in um, incredible universities at scale, right? Now, whilst a lot of work has happened through organizations like NSTC and, and the push from the government, um, it's still it's still limited when you compare that to the to the scale of India and India's population, right? Um, so there is this lack of at scale credible universities, and then there is a lack of outcome linked skilling, right? For someone who is in the middle of jobs, who's financially constrained, for them to commit, um, you know, any sort of capital without having uh, an outcome linked to it, particularly with a lot of the segment and ourselves and Indians being value conscious, it makes it extremely challenging, right? Um, and so I think what needs to happen is almost a hyper personalization when it comes to skilling and upskilling, right? And so one of the things that um, we at Apna are able to do again because of the, the leverage of technology is, um, say if we have about, uh, you know, over 13 to 15 million users, uh, candidates who are looking for jobs. Uh, when, when a candidate um, is applying for a job, we are precisely able to measure uh, and test uh, this person on the skill sets um, that he or she needs to be able to apply for that job, right? It's a simple process, it takes about a couple of minutes, but you precisely identify, say for someone who's applying for you know, accountant, an entry level accountant, right? What's his ability and knowledge around GST related metrics, right? How good or bad is he on just basic Excel skills, right? At that point, uh, a lot of users, they pass the test and they move on to finding uh, opportunities with recruiters and HR employees, um, but a lot of them actually fail. Now, because we as a platform using technology and data understand what are the skill sets that this person actually lacks at this point, I'm able to almost pitch a micro course, you know, sort of the sun silk sachet, if you will, of, of skilling at a very reasonable price point. And also guarantee an interview, if not a job, to that to that user if he or she takes that course. You've suddenly created this site, created the cycle where you've reached and pitched to a candidate precisely at the point when he or she is most desirable of a job. You've pitched to this person specifically a skill set that you know he's lacking, and because of which he's not been able to move ahead in the journey of opportunity uh, creation. And you've linked it to an outcome. Because a lot of these roles, are, it's very black and white, right? Like if you want, if you need to be a delivery partner or you need to know how to write, you need to have a driving license and you need to have certain documentations. So once I know that, you know, I could guarantee this person to move up in the funnel of interviewing and seeking a job, thus closing a loop and increasing the ability and the desire for this person to invest in themselves, right? And I think just fundamentally, these are the things that need to be solved. And once you do that, then I think they're enough and more opportunities and training partners and um, and startups that are coming up uh, to, to provide skilling opportunities to folks in, in this segment. Great, uh, Manas, I think uh, uh, we come to the last 10 minutes which we've been allowed to. So I'm gonna have you, each one of you give your um, sort of concluding remarks, but around one point, I think uh, the key takeaway from each one of your uh, uh, interventions has been that uh, lifelong learning is a must. From Manas's, we've taken off that uh, uh, our understanding is that um, uh, you know we need to assess uh, applicability to job at each point, and that's possible to do with technology, which has broken the barriers there. And therefore, we know what's the gap in the uh, the knowledge and skill level. Um, now, let me just move to each one of you for their sort of uh, rounding off remarks on this. Um, Sandeep, in your case, 
the industry is where the dexterity matters. Communication and dexterity is very important. I mean, uh, nobody would want to go to a beautician or a hairstylist uh, if both uh, are questionable. How do you see what Manas has said? Applying and will technology be the last uh, um, bastion to really break to get there? You're on mute. Not able to hear you. So while we wait for Sandeep to come back on, uh, Prasad, do you want to sort of give your uh, closing remarks and we'll have Sandeep come in? Yeah, so I think uh, what uh, Manas said is right, that the Sunsil kind of packaging for every industry, if it can be built, that, that shortage of that last 10-20% which helps the person to really get the job, uh, at least in financial services and fintech world is a must. I mean, let's 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 put it this way: beat Sandeep's uh, workforce, or let's say Mithun's workforce. Finally, we are going to sell a banking service to a truck driver who is looking for a good banking service, and he needs financial health support to increase his life to upskilling and therefore live a good life. Right? The starting point is the key to their success. So it will be a combination of technology. Have we lost Prasad also? Others lost connection, so we can ask other panelists to conclude. Mithun, uh, do you want to come in? Sure. Um, in terms of closing remarks, right? So, see, two things, right? The way forward for most companies in any gig economy space is um, how, how can we take this, let's say we started bottom up or top down, how do we start from Taiwan city and then expand to all the cities across India and then, you know, do the same thing and repeat the magic, let's say bottom up, right, and see if we can build scalable solutions and so on. Uh, so one of the two areas, right, two particular points are collaboration. I feel that a lot of startups and the government and a lot of us, we work in islands. We don't collaborate much. I think there's a lot that can be done through collaboration. Uh, I think startups need to do that a lot. And the second thing is, I think, in terms of capital deployment, I feel that like just like roads, dams, infrastructure, I think startups are going to be, especially gig economy startups in mobility are going to be the largest employers, or at least in the top three, very quickly, if they're already not, right, indirectly. So I think in terms of government needs to think about how, how we can deploy capital to actually make this a little more, it's still fragile, even large companies are still fragile. How can we make this more robust by deploying uh, um, let's say, debt support and so on. I think uh, there's a bunch of things that can be done. So collaboration, increased collaboration at the startup level, I think can create a much more robust gig economy uh, kind of outlook. And government can definitely help with capital deployment, not necessarily through equity, but even through debt. So I feel that these two pieces will really kind of supercharge this particular market. Thanks, Mithun. I don't know if Prasad's on. Prasad, are you on? So, uh, Manas, your sort of closing remarks. Manas also dropped off, is it? We hey, no, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I thought we we're certainly having a bad internet day, like a bad hair day, I guess. Hey, guys, can, can, can you hear me? I'm still here. Yes, 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 Manas. Loud and hey, clear. Um, yeah, no, so, uh, you know, well, I think. 
uh, two things I would like to say, right, in, in terms of concluding this. Um, see, this, this whole problem of, um, or I would say opportunity of closing the employment skills and network gap um, will only be solved if we, if we target this very, very holistically. I think um, uh, recognizing all the great efforts through, uh, through a lot of institutions over the years, uh, I think one challenge has been that uh, people have targeted different facets of this problem in isolation. Right? Whilst people have created job platforms um, to, for discovering jobs and matching, uh, matching individuals, uh, they've not focused on um, you know, uh, upskilling these individuals to be able to access jobs. Or, uh, I mean, leave alone upskilling, even skilling individuals to be able to access the jobs that exist today, right? Um, whilst, uh, whilst certain institutions have focused on, um, on creating skilling and job opportunities, not enough has been done in terms of closing the network gap and extending and expanding the network that each of these individuals has today to be able to now look for jobs, right? Um, and so we would have to start looking at very holistically, either individual companies trying to solve for these together or by extensive collaboration where, uh, you know, a, a skilling uh, institution is tied up very strongly with multiple job platforms, which in turn is tied up with, uh, with social and professional networks to be able to start, you know, bringing a lot of these opportunities together. So I think that's that's one facet of it, right? Just trying to, we would need to look start looking at it very, very holistically. I don't think this problem gets solved um, by by trying to solve it in isolation. It's sort of you know three legs of a tripod, right? It doesn't stand if any one of the legs isn't there, and if they all have to be at the same height, at the same place, in the same in the right uh, situation. I think the second piece to consider is um, you know corporations, governments, and this workforce, right? Uh, you need to be able to tie all of these together, these things together, and you know, um, and, and platforms and marketplaces um, and, and new age startups are certainly have a huge responsibility to be able to do that. that right? um, I think uh, in our end, up now, what we're trying to do is, whilst we have, you know, over 150,000 uh, employers on the platform trying to connect these people with their talent needs with, with the gig economy. We also have types with uh, institutions like, uh, such as yourself, the NS, uh, NSDC, um, where, you know, for all these individuals who are looking for jobs, we are able to connect them with training partners to continue to upskill themselves to be able to now get these opportunities that exist on the platform. And we also have a professional network in the works where you know, the, the, these 13 million users can actually learn from each other, can share job opportunities, can um, can create influences amongst themselves to be able to now continue to teach and train and learn from each other, right? Uh, so I think it, it the way we are headed is, I think trying to solve this problem collectively, holistically, um, through employment, network, and skills will have to start happening much more in tandem and, and, and in, a, in a very, very strong, um, collaborative way if we have if you want to have any shot at solving this mega earth scale problem um, uh, is uh, is what i would uh, my views would be thank you so much manas and thank you to all uh, all uh, my fellow panelists i think we're absolutely run out of time um, i hope uh, everybody had um, had a useful listen as you close the day so thank you so much. Over to you, Ishita. Thank you, Gayatri, and all the panelists for sharing your knowledge and experience on the session. Uh, with this session, we conclude day one of Charcha 2021. We will resume tomorrow with more exciting and insightful sessions steered by sector and industry experts. Do join us at 10 a.m. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.